Thank you, Stephen, for putting together this wonderful workshop. At this first 50 year celebration of the PDB, I thought it would be fun to take a historical perspective and present a history of, of structural and functional characterization of a very large family of signaling proteins known as response regulators. And in particular, how the cumulative structure uh, structures archived in the PDB by numerous laboratories has provided an understanding of the mechanisms of regulation employed by a simple but extremely versatile domain. While the distinct features and limits to conservation of mechanism in a family of structurally and functionally similar, similar homologs are specific to this one family of proteins, the principles may be more broadly applicable. So the protein family I will discuss is the response regulator family of signal transduction proteins found in two component systems. These systems are now known long after their initial discovery and naming to be um, based on a, a core phosphotransfer mechanism between a histidine protein kinase and a response regulator protein. Both proteins contain conserved enzyme domains linked to variable domains. In the case of the histidine kinase, this is a sensor domain. And in the case of the response regulator, this is a response output or effector domain. The variable domains allow for just about any chemical or physical stimulus to be coupled to just about any kind of response output, providing a very versatile mechanism that enables cells um, to give adaptive responses to changes in their environment. Two component systems are prevalent in bacteria. They're present in all domains of life. However, they're not found in animals. Bacterial genomes typically encode several dozen two component systems and more than 300,000 two component systems have been identified in bacterial genomes to date. Adaptive responses are critical for bacteria to survive and thrive, and they're especially important for bacteria-host interactions, both pathogenic and beneficial interactions. Beyond human health, two-component systems are also of importance in environmental microbiology, for example, in bioremediation and agriculture. Our understanding of two component systems has developed over several decades. It began with a project focused on determining the function of KY, a protein involved in chemotaxis. Sequencing of the gene revealed similarities between a few proteins that have been identified from genetic screens to be involved in some very different regulatory systems in bacteria. With only about 20 to 30% sequence identity and pairwise comparison of the proteins, however, the significance of the finding was met with great skepticism. Indeed, my graduate advisor, Dan Koshland, pulled our manuscript from publication at PNAS when my thesis committee questioned the significance of the sequence similarities, and it was months before it was resubmitted. Undaunted, I was determined to establish a common basis for function among these regulators and decided to pursue structural studies. Together with Jim Moten from Greg Petsko's lab, we solved the structure of PY. As a historical note, this was back in the day when ribbon diagrams were drawn by hand using the instructions described by Jane Richardson in a Methods in Enzymology article. The structure was notable in several regards. We had used an engineered cysteine substitution to derivatize the protein with mercury for phase determination, the refer first report of such a strategy. The structure established the fold of the response regulator receiver domain or rec domain as it was eventually named. The positioning of conserved nonpolar residues in the hydrophobic core of the protein left little doubt about the structural similarity of other family members. Most importantly, three conserved residues, two aspartates and a lysine, clustered together in the crossover cleft, a position that had been established by Carl Branden to be the binding site or active sites in doubly wound alpha-beta domains. 
Meanwhile, in parallel with the structure determination, understanding of the biochemistry of two component signaling proteins progressed rapidly in the labs of Mel Simon at Caltech and Jeff Stock at Princeton. Following elucidation of the phosphotransfer pathway in these labs, key Y was shown to be phosphorylated at aspartate 57. It was found that key Y catalyzed phosphoryl transfer um, most definitively by the finding that phosphorylation could be achieved not only in reactions with the histidine kinase, but also small molecules um, could be used as phosphodonors. And the structure of PY bound to magnesium, which was actually the first structure determined in my lab at Rutgers, allowed us to propose the mechanism for phosphotransfer. Subsequently, Sydney Kustis' lab at Berkeley reported the beryllium, that beryllium fluoride, BEF3, could serve as a phosphomimetic for the chemically labile phosphospartate. And this opened the door for determination of an NMR structure of a receiver domain in an active conformation, solved by Dorothy Kern and colleagues in David Wemmer's lab. As seen in this animation, the receiver domain can be thought of as a switch domain existing in two predominant conformational states, with phosphorylation stabilizing one state deemed the active conformation. Research then shifted towards answering two fundamental questions. How does this common switch regulate so many different effector outputs? And which features are conserved and which differ among response regulators? Specifically, are things observed in one response regulator true for all? We now have answers to these questions with help from more than 750 structures of proteins containing receiver domains that have been deposited in the PBB. There is an enormous structural diversity among the hundreds of thousands of response regulators. They can be classified by the structures of their effector domains. The receiver domain can exist as a standalone domain for which the effector domain is a separate protein. An example of this is the chemotaxis protein PY, which in its active conformation interacts with the flagellar motor to control swimming behavior. Two thirds of response regulators are transcription factors with DNA binding domains belonging to different fold families. Others are RNA binding proteins or protein protein interaction domains. About 10% are enzymes the largest class being those that synthesize or degrade messenger, uh, the, the second messenger, cyclic DIGMP. Our lab has contributed to the characterization of some of these families. We determined the structure um, in collaboration with Helen Berman of the DNA binding domain of Ampar, establishing a winged helix fold for the largest family of response regulator transcription factors. We determined the structure of Staphylococcus aureus AGRA, establishing the unusual beta sheet fold for the litter family of transcription factors that regulate virulence and pathogens. We determined the first structure of a multi-domain response regulator, the chemotaxis methylesterase KB, and also the first structure of a response regulator transcription factor in both inactive and active conformations an RL family member involved in vancomycin resistance in Staphylococcus aureus. Not surprisingly, given the diversity in effector domains, there's great variation in the mechanisms of regulation of their activities by receiver domains. This diversity exists not only between subfamilies, but also within members of the same subfamily. Regulation is achieved by different protein-protein interactions that discriminate between the inactive and active conformations of the receiver domain. And these interactions can be inhibitory or activating. In this schematic diagram of an NTRC family member, activation results from relief of an inhibitory interaction. Interaction of the inactive receiver domain with the ATPase domain inhibits oligomerization that is required to form an open complex for transcription initiation. Phosphorylation of the receiver domain or an engineered deletion of the domain is sufficient to disrupt the inhibitory interaction, allowing oligomerization and transcription activation. 
In contrast, another NTRC family member uses a positive regulatory mechanism where the receiver domain upon phosphorylation um, dimerizes, uh, sorry, where, where the, the a receiver domain upon phosphorylation is involved in a positive interaction with a neighboring ATPase domain to drive oligomerization and open complex formation. Some proteins use a combination of both inhibitory and activating interactions. In inactive RAR, which is a staph aureus protein involved in vancomycin resistance, the receiver domain forms a tight in interface with the DNA binding domain. In Agrobra R, a long linker helix shown here in cyan unwinds somewhat, freeing the receiver domains to dimerize and exposing helix alpha 10 of the DNA binding domain, which mediates dimerization of the DNA binding domains in an orientation compatible with the recognition helices of, the D, uh, of this domain to be able to recognize their DNA binding site. This combination of both inhibitory and activating mechanisms produces a strong barrier between the off and on states. The dimerization affinities for inactive and active bra R differ by more than 10,000 fold. Dimerization of receiver domains is a common mechanism for activation of response regulator transcription factors and many different modes of dimerization have been observed in different response regulators. The OPRFOB family, which accounts for about half of response regulator transcription factors, is unique in having a conserved mode of dimerization mediated by the alpha-4, beta-5, alpha-5 phase shown here in these diagrams in gold. This conserved interface involves a highly conserved set of salt bridges and a small hydrophobic patch that's present in all receiver domains of the OPRFOB family members. Despite the sequence conservation, however, the molecular surfaces of different response regulators are distinct owing to sequence variations in second shell residues. In a genomic scale examination of the 14 OPRFOBIC family members present in E. coli, we found a high degree of discrimination for formation of HOMO rather than heterodimers. Although the mode of dimerization in the active state is conserved for OPRFOBIC family members, the domain arrangements observed in the inactive proteins all differ. Some have no interface between domains, others have tight interfaces, some of which vary the recognition helices at the domain interface, ensuring that the, the protein is really in a locked off state. Where interfaces exist, they all involve the alpha-4, beta-5, alpha-5 phase of the receiver domain, but they, this surface interacts with different surfaces of the DNA binding domains. Interestingly, in proteins with interfaces, the interdomain interaction is stabilized by a hydrogen bond that forms a latch between the conserved tyrosine switch residue in the receiver domain and either an aspartate or an asparagine in the DNA binding domain. However, because of the different orientations of the DNA binding domains, it is a different residue that partners with the conserved tyrosine in each protein. And in each protein, it's located on a different element of secondary structure. We hypothesize that the different domain arrangements with exposed or varied recognition helices provide different levels of basal transcription activity by the unphosphorylated response regulator, and that different domain interface arrangements provide different strength switches between off and on states that might be optimized for the specific needs of individual regulatory pathways. And now, finally, for one last story, I will return to KY, the chemotaxis response regulator. This remarkable little single domain protein in different states interacts with five different domains in other chemotaxis proteins. These interactions have been structurally described by many laboratories. Martin Welch and colleagues determined the structure of E. coli KY bound to the P2 domain of the histidine kinase Ta shown here in the top panel. 
When Brian Crane's lab determined the structure of the same complex of Thermotoga meridima proteins a few years later, they observed a distinctly different interface, which used the same alpha-4, beta-5, alpha-5 base of PY, but with a 90-degree rotation of the P2 domain. Clearly, the story of different response regulators I have recounted today suggests that regulatory protein-protein interactions observed in one response regulator have limited predictive ability for other response regulators. The interactions shown here for KPY take this one step further, indicating that predictions might not be possible even for interactions of the same signaling proteins in different organisms. In summary, the large collection of response regulator structures has provided substantial insights into the versatile phosphorylation regulated receiver domain of response regulators. A small number of these features are conserved. These are limited to the active site residues and their enzymatic mechanisms. The fundamental regulatory strategy involving two predominant conformations, one stabilized by phosphorylation, and a general regulatory strategy based on different protein-protein interactions favored by the two conformational states. But there are many non-conserved features that are customizable, allowing for response regulators to be adapted to the needs of different regulatory systems. These include the enzymatic activities that vary by as much as six orders of magnitude amongst different response regulators the conformational perturbations between inactive and active states that differ both in their magnitude and in the surfaces that are affected, diversity in both structures and functions of effector domains, different mechanisms of regulation involving inhibitory and activating interactions, different oligomeric states for both inactive and active response regulators, and different domain arrangements and surfaces used for protein-protein interactions. As we head into the era of structural biology where predictions are made based on a wealth of accumulated data, it's important to keep in mind that the diversity that has been observed in the response regulator family um, means that there may be a, a limit to, to these predictions and we must realize that the structures that have been determined to date may be only a small sampling of the range of domain interactions that are possible. So I'd like to end here um, by acknowledging colleagues with whom I've had, I've co-deposited structures in the protein data bank through the years. Those who have worked on response regulators and have contributed in various ways to the story I have presented today are indicated in bold. And thank you for indulging me in this walk down memory lane.